So good morning and welcome to Surgery Grand Rounds. We have a particularly special presentation this morning. Um, it's obviously very salient given the ongoing opioid crisis in our nation and facing our healthcare system. Uh, this presentation actually resulted uh, from the weekly meetings with the residents with our chairman. Uh, they kind of brought up the issue of feeling the challenges of trying to deal with many of the patients that we receive from the Whammy region with significant injuries and requiring a significant amount of opioids given uh, their diagnosis or condition and trying to manage that uh, from such a remote distance and the precarious nature of that. So taking that question or that concern, uh, two of our uh, chief residents, Barclay Stewart and Lisa Legron, turned this into the presentation this morning and I greatly appreciate all the effort that they've put into it. So we have three speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Deborah Gordon. She's the co-director of the Harborview Integrated Pain Care Program, and she's a teaching associate with the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Washington. Uh, she definitely works with both inpatient out and outpatient pain relief services on excuse me, improving the systems of care and pain management. She's a co-investigator for the University of Washington's NIH-designated Center of Excellence in Pain Education, and she's been a leader both nationally and internationally in developing quality improvement guidelines with regard to pain management and is an active leader in the American Pain Association, the International Association for the Study of Pain, and as a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. Our, our, our other next speaker is Dr. Jared Klein. He is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. He currently serves as an attending physician in the adult medicine clinic at Harborview Medical Center and is also a specialist in addictions medicine. Uh, he's director of the aftercare clinic and is an active member in the hospital's opioid review committee, a champion for management of opioid therapy uh, chronically. And he uh, sounds like he's actively working on some programs to engage patients in their own care for of addictions via new online portals. Uh, and last, uh, Dr. Ivan Lesnick is an associate clinical, excuse me, professor in anesthesiology at the University of Washington. He is the chief of pain services at Harborview Medical Center and also co-director of the Harborview Integrated Pain Care Program. Prior to coming to the University of Washington, he had an illustrious career in my beloved United States Navy. Uh, and served uh, a number of very important roles there, including serving as uh, the, excuse me, uh, specialty leader in a variety of other things. Um, he completed a pain fellowship after much of his leadership work in the Navy and went on to become the deputy program director, excuse me, director for the Navy's comprehensive pain management program and also developed and served as the director of the Navy, Navy Medicine's first operationalized functional restoration pain program. So we have quite the lineup this morning. I'm gonna stop there and give the rest of the time to our speakers. We are thrilled to be here. I think this is such an important topic and an important collaborative for us to be talking about this subject. Um, I wanted to just add to my background, one of the reasons I'm also interested in this area, not only that I've been a surgery trauma nurse my whole life, but that I chaired the American Pain Society's post-op guidelines that were released in 2015. That's the most recent evidence-based national guideline that was done in collaboration with the American Society of Anesthesiologists and Regional Anesthesiologists. So I'll make some, some reference to that uh, as we go along. Um, so my task is really to just kind of give you the bigger picture about what's happened with the opiate epidemic, where we are, and a little about what we know about how we're doing here. So I'll try and do that, let's see. Uh, I think you've probably all seen this a million, a million times. Uh, I tell you, every time I look at it, I feel really old, and it's not just because I know I'm old enough to be the mother of most of you in this room, but um, when I was in practice as a staff nurse, uh, we very much undertreated pain, and I would say we're still undertreating pain today. We're just overusing the uh, opioids, but we're not really addressing kind of the, the big, bigger issue of how we treat pain. Um, but clearly, like, uh, it wasn't that long ago in, in many of the people in this room's career, uh, in surgery in particular, that we didn't ask about pain. We didn't use zero to 10. Everybody kind of got PRNIM injections. And 
uh, we knew that we needed to do better. And there's been a lot of finger pointing over the last two decades, and that's not what we're here to do today, but I think it is important to understand all of the various forces that came together, including just increasing the visibility of pain, having the Joint Commission standards that asked us to address those. Um, that kind of led to this feeling also that opioids were safe and there was no end organ toxicity and there was no iatrogenic addiction. And um, through 20 years of experience of using opioids more long term in higher doses and for chronic pain, we now know that um, there's very little benefit long term. And in fact, there are significant neuroendocrine immune uh, adverse effects of long term opioids as well as addiction. I'm sorry, use the right one. Um, you know, if you want a little more information, and I think this is a fascinating sociological history, I would highly recommend these two books. Uh, the Pursuit of Oblivion was recommended by John Lozier at the beginning of the decade of pain control and research, the second only decade declared by Congress about 15 years ago. This takes you from the opium war all the way up to the Bush administration and policy and how that's affected use of opioids globally. Uh, it really talks about the fact that sobriety is not a normal human state. And throughout history, uh, people have sought to um, uh, alter their universe. Uh, Dreamland, I hope you've all seen that or heard about that. I would highly recommend that. I mean, it really talks about what's happened most recently and how um, this very successful marketing of small business operations really led to the spread of heroin and uh, illicit opioids in this country. And it really has a lot of discussion about the University of Washington and the role that's being played. So great book if you haven't seen it. Uh, you know, again, I suspect this isn't new to you, but the numbers are absolutely staggering. 91 people die every day in the United States from overdose, and most of those involve in opioids. We have more than 1,000 people that present to emergency departments with uh, opioid-related problems. Um, we know that we have something like 5% of the U.S. population, and yet we use 80% of the world's opioids in this country. And we also know that um, surgeons write 10% of all opioids in this country, second only to pain specialists. So uh, it's, it's really amazing. I'm sure every one of you in this room has been affected, either personally or professionally, by folks that have been troubled by opioids. Uh, you've probably seen a million of these curves, too. They all look the same. Even though we've seen some bending of the curve in Washington, we're still seeing significant increases of death um, from both prescription and illicit opioids. This happens to be, um, I think, the CDC. And they estimated in uh, 2016 we had 65,000 deaths from opioids in the United States. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really of interest now and the literature is really just exploding is uh, the relationship of acute <laughs> opioids, uh, acute pain. This is um, a recent study that looked at the new persistent opioid use after minor and major surgeries. And it looks like across all, people would say that 3 to 10 percent of patients that are having either minor or major surgery a year later are still using opioids of some kind. And we know that about 80 percent of opioids given to people are unused in their room. And it, it doesn't seem to make a difference if you're looking at minor or major. It's across uh, all men, women, uh, ages, procedures. Uh, this is a slide that really shows then uh, the variability of uh, post-operative opioid prescribing. This is three major medical centers across 25 of the most common surgical elective procedures. Uh, it looks like if you see this line at the bottom, that was the ideal threshold they said, which was a 200 morphine equivalent dose. And you can see how many of the prescribing practices are way above that. And look at the wide variability. I mean, look at the the top and bottom of the whisker plots. And again, the authors concluded that uh, the wide variation was not explained by the patient or operative factors. So we know we have a lot of variation that we can look at improving. Um, and here's, you know, again, part of the, oh, that's kind of weird that that didn't show up. Um, this is um, just, again, uh, to show that a lot of the leftover opioids that are in people's medicine cabinets go on to, to be 
problematic in terms of diversion. I have to look at this because I have small faces. So 64% of people using pain relievers non-medically, non -medically, which is this big gray bar, said that they obtained uh, the opioid from a friend or a relative. And according to a 2009 survey, uh, it was easier for teenagers to buy opioids than it was to get beer. So lots of literature to show that uh, leftover pills are being used inappropriately. So how many pills do you need to prescribe? Again, this is a really interesting area that we've been looking at uh, through the state. Uh, lots of authors are publishing this. This is a, um, a very nice study that looked at 642 patients. Again, uh, common surgical procedures. Most of these people were sent home with 20 to 120 tablets and took only 28, 30 percent of them. Um, so this is the number of pills these patients used once they went home. Very small. Um, the probability of continued use among opiate naive patients uh, spikes uh, already at three days. Um, these are modeling, but it looks like the risk of chronic opioid use increases by 1% after that, that third day. It looks like the second prescription doubles the risk of opioid use. And um, this article by Pratt, which is most recent, is really fascinating because it looks like it's the total duration of opioid use as the strongest predictor of misuse. So it wasn't the amount of opioids so much as the duration. So again, it's lining up with what you're hearing from CDC and others to use not only the shortest dose, but the shortest duration of opioid therapy. So I think the summary for this is that we overprescribe in this country uh, for acute pain for opioids. 42 to 71 percent or maybe 80 percent of opioids go unused and they're not properly disposed. And persistent opioid use, again, is just as likely after minor surgery as it is after major surgery. So prescribing less really equals good care. Uh, there are studies that show patients are just as satisfied. They don't report more pain. They don't call you back like we think they will and ask for more prescriptions. Uh, they use fewer pills. There's fewer left over. And they're not, again, more likely to get refills. So in, of course, the surgical literature, I'm sure you've probably seen this, there's calls for surgical leadership to look at uh, how to help the country deal with this opioid epidemic. And I think this is a nice paper that really talked about, you know, I think historically surgeons uh, in, unintentionally overprescribe because they're trying to meet 99 to 100 percent of patients' needs because we know in this environment, it's very difficult, especially if you're out on the peninsula or in Alaska and you've had surgery here, to get a refill to come back to see a prescriber. But um, I think uh, the trend is that we have to prescribe for um, the majority of people who probably only need five to ten tablets. So um, Barclay and all asked us to really, again, link this a little to some of the things that are happening locally. Uh, around this. So one of the things that you've probably heard about is the Agency for Medical Directors Guideline Group. This is a collaborative of third-party payers in the state of Washington and stakeholders, including the University of Washington. And they developed opioid guidelines initially in 2007. Um, Dr. Tauban has been very involved in that. They were updated in 2010, and then uh, I had the ability to participate in the update when I got here to Washington in 2015. And that was the first time that we added a section on perioperative pain. Dr. Terman from the University of Washington uh, has led that effort. And we are now in the process of updating those for 2018, <clears throat> excuse me, as the, as the legislative rules develop. So Dr. Terman is really looking for input from surgeons on those. So if you haven't talked to him already, he asked me to share his email. Uh, to contact him if you're interested in providing some update on what those will look like. Um, there's kind of two parallel processes going. Updating the AMDG guideline, which is really designed around best practice guidance, and then the conceptual rules. You know, Governor Inslee signed a bill last summer that said that by January of 2019, we needed new legislative rules for opioids in the state of Washington. And again, very uh, uniquely, this will include acute pain and perioperative pain. And those rules are drafted in probably their third or fourth version. And you can look at those on the Department of Health's website if you want to. And they're, they're very specific about uh, discharge prescribing. This is a little busy uh, table, but I just wanted to kind of help align where all this stuff is coming from. So you've probably heard about the CDC opioid guidelines. 
Those came out of the national pain strategy. So the Institute of Medicine had a blueprint on transforming pain care in the United States. It led to a national pain strategy, and several programs uh, resulted in that, including the Centers for Disease Control Opioid Guidelines, which again are mainly focused on chronic pain, but you'll notice they have at the bottom for acute pain uh, probably no more than three days, rarely more than seven days. As I mentioned, the 2015 Washington AMDG guidelines, we added a perioperative section. And at that point, we really said, don't send someone home with more than two weeks prescription. If people needed opioids beyond two weeks, they probably needed to be reevaluated. Uh, the 2018 guidelines are lining up a little more specifically. You'll find that there'll be a table that really specifically looks at the evidence that we have about these procedures and how many pills people need and recommends things like 8 to 12 pills or up to 42 tablets for certain patients when they're discharged from the hospital. It also has a lot of language about the use of prescription monitoring programs, which is mandated in many states, and I think it's going to certainly be mandated at some point here. It's just highly recommended. Uh, and then the Washington rules. So the difference, again, between the rules on the far right and the guidelines is the guidelines are best practice. The rules are really going to be used for disciplinary action where providers are not following uh, any best guidance. Um, and again, you'll notice there's a lot of specific information about checking PMP and limiting the prescription dose and providing naloxone for patients at high risk. And a lot of things have, are happening already in front of the finalization of these rules. I think you probably know that in November of this year, the Department of Health issued a new payment policy for Medicaid and all of their managed care and fee-for-service uh, programs. And they really will not pay for more than 42 doses, which is approximately a seven-day supply for their patients uh, of adults. Now, you can override this for any patient by just saying exempt on it. But again, you can see that prescribers are real, or excuse me, third-party payers are really driving uh, the amount of prescription that patients can go home with. Uh, I wanted to just show you a couple metrics. I only have metrics for Harborview. This is uh, metrics that we developed in the last year. This is on the Access to Excellence, which is you can all see uh, on the internet site for Harborview if you dive into the pain metrics. Um, I know it's, it's pretty small, but what we've tried to look at is uh, the percentage of patients within the first 24 hours after surgery who received opioids only. Nothing else but opioids. And you'll see it's um, this small line here. We put the green threshold as 10%. We don't know exactly what it is, but we assume that most people should have multimodal analgesia. And then we looked at patients that have an opioid plus um, at least one other non-opioid and those who got two or more opioids because multimodal analgesia is really recommended, and that would include Tylenol, NSAIDs local anesthetics, et cetera. So it's, you know, we're just keeping an eye on that. You can look at your surgical specialty and see how that looks within yours. Um, this is not on access to excellence, but we did build a measure to look at what is going out the door at Harborview for all opioid discharge prescriptions. And again, it's a little busy, but uh, we had originally looked, been monitoring for how many patients had less than two weeks, and we just recently looked at how many patients were going out with less than 42 tablets. And it looked like it was about 57%. So almost half of the patients are going out with more than what is recommended. Um, this looks at some of the higher doses and then, of course, who's prescribing. And at Harborview, again, it's going to be mostly orthopedics and neurospine because of the types of <laughs> operations that are done. And this just updates the data from 2017 through the early part of 2018. And again, you'll see, <coughs> excuse me, that there is some room for improvement. So the green are the higher doses, and the blue is the 42 tablets or less. And you can look by service again. So these measures are available. I think we can certainly um, export them to UW. So just a quick summary. Um, what is it that you can do as a surgeon? I think, again, these best practices are really to obtain a preoperative evaluation to look at who's at risk for difficult to control pain, opioid adverse effects, uh, maybe persistent opioid use, and uh, we have some information about how to do that screening. Really counseling the patient and managing their expectations that pain is normal. Yes, you're going to have pain, but it doesn't mean that opioids is the best treatment for that, particularly when you go home. Somebody sometime around the perioperative section probably needs to check the PMP. That's, I think, going to be mandated. So I think we have to figure out how we're going to operationalize that. 
We need to provide balanced multimodal analgesia. We need to use the lowest effective dose. We need to avoid new prescriptions for CNS depressants, benzodiazepines, sending people out, raising the risk for overdose. Uh, the clinical practice guidelines say as soon as someone is oral and tolerating oral, use short-acting oral opioids only. You don't need to use preneral. There's no need to use long-acting opioids. And again, um, consider the use of naloxone rescue. So there is guidance. This is the American Pain Society's, <coughs> excuse me, evidence-based practice guidelines. And there is a table in there that talks a little about how to manage patients who have chronic pain or chronic opioid dosing. And I won't go through that, but uh, there, there are guidelines out there that are pretty basic. So this is my last slide, and it's just a take-home message. This is, I think, what we've been trying to do culturally across the university. Um, certainly, we've been doing a lot of work at Harborview to try and move our focus away from opioids as the first and mainstay of pain management and avoid chasing numeric pain ratings and having natural conversations with people about pain is normal, it's trying to improve your function and get you to recover and uh, avoid adverse e events, and really having that communication counseling with patients and using non-pharmacologic strategies. This patient handout, which is two pages, is given for every opioid discharge prescription filled at any University of Washington pharmacy. So for the last year, even patients who fill their prescription from UWMC will get this handout that talks about use your non-opioids and non-pharmacologic strategies first. It talks about safe use and storage of opioids. So it's something that you might want to take a look at so you know that you can kind of reinforce that with your patients. Hi, everyone. I'm Jared Klein. And uh, definitely thank you to Barkley and Lacey for inviting me. And it's great, great to be here this morning. I'm a primary care internist at Harborview. Um, and I, do, I have um, additional training in addiction medicine. And um, I work really closely with Deb and Ivan, um, both with some of the outpatient uh, folks and also during, tran during transitions of care and also seeing the patients um, on the pain service that have uh, been identified as having a substance use disorder and trying to help engage those folks in addiction treatment. And so that's where I kind of come at this with the lens of um, really taking care of folks that have already been identified uh, with addiction or concern concern for potential addiction. And I wanted to characterize this as thinking about this as really a, an, the, the, the time when someone's undergoing surgery or has an acute injury in the hospital. This is an opportunity to really engage those folks in care and get them um, linked in with services potentially. So um, I'm really passionate about this topic. I love talking about it. I love seeing patients and working with patients um, with this particular diagnosis. I don't have any financial disclosures, though, unfortunately. So my outline is I want to talk a little bit about what, how do we ask about um, opioid use disorder or addiction in our patients, what things, what concrete things can, uh, could you do as surgeons, and then what kind of resources and referrals are out there in the community. So really the, the biggest take home is just to ask. I think this is something that probably um, doesn't happen enough right now. Um, but we really want to ask patients about their opioid use and their other substance use. I pulled, uh, this is the current, I think it was recently updated, Harborview uh, surgery health history questionnaire that the patient will fill out. And it does have this nice section here on, um, you know, do you use a treatment for, a medication treatment for addiction, like methadone or buprenorphine, and do you have, any, have you used any drugs in the last six months? Um, really, I think our patients are reluctant to sometimes offer this up. This is a st highly stigmatized um, condition, as you recognize. Um, and even those in recovery um, have many reasons not to disclose their diagnosis. They might, um, you know, they're, they're coming looking for care, and they might, they don't want anything to, um, to get in between, you know, prevent them from having that necessary care. There really aren't validated screening tools for preoperative assessment of substance use. I wanted to share, this is, in, this is a validated question that's used in primary care, which is how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or a prescription medication for non-medical reasons? Um, and it's specifically phrased that way for several reasons. One is to assume use, which um, will help um, improve your, uh, your pickup of, uh, folks with an issue, um, and also it touches both on illegal substance but also uh, misuse of prescription medications. And when they've compared this to a full psychiatric exam and urine testing, um, it's a highly sensitive question. Um, it really gets to the point, though, of 
how do you differentiate someone who's on chronic opioid therapy, someone who's maybe misusing chronic opioids, um, or someone who has an actual addiction issue? And this is really, really challenging, um, even for folks that do this all the time. Um, I, we, we focus on these, what's called the three Cs, so compulsive use of opioids, the loss of control, and then negative consequences are all the kind of um, adversive behavioral manifestations of substance use, and that's the way that we really well, are, are able to put someone who had been, if you have an addiction, you have a substance use disorder. Um, but you should definitely reach out to get help from pain medicine colleagues, psychiatry or addiction medicine um, during these challenging um, to sort out cases. <laughs> You know, I, I'm a big proponent of how you ask about this. Um, really makes a difference. Sometimes opioid use disorder is obvious. It might be all over the chart. It might the patient might um, readily kind of offer that up during the history, but sometimes it can be quite subtle. Um, so it's really important to, to establish that rapport. Sometimes asking about past use can be m less threatening to patients. Um, really listen to the story. Um, assume that there's going to be or anticipate there's going to be some guilt and shame involved, and also um, it's incredibly common for folks to have had negative experiences with healthcare system before. Um, and so you can anticipate those stories also. Um, I would, again, avoid, you know, don't avoid the topic of addiction um, and try not to make assumptions because everyone's story is different. This was an interesting study from about a decade ago. Was, um, these folks randomized 500 mental health professionals to read one of two clinical vignettes. Um, and one characterizes this patient as a substance abuser, and he's attending a treatment program. He's required to be abstinent. abstinent. He's been compliant until a month ago when he's had some positive urine testing. Um, he's been a substance abuser for the past few years. So they randomized folks to either read this clinical vignette or this clinical vignette, was, which was only altered um, in the phrasing of the the diagnosis here, which was uh, either as a substance use disorder um, or a substance abuser. And potentially, not surprisingly, those who are shown the substance abuser term were significantly more likely to judge the person deserving of blame and punishment versus those that were shown the term substance use disorder, which is the medically accurate terminology based on the DSM-5, um, which was um, updated about five or 10 years ago now. And I'm a big believer that patients really perceive these attitudes, and what we say um, makes a big difference. So these are my personal recommendations. Um, you know, I try to use, and this can be challenging even for me, um, because some of these terms are really ingrained in our culture. But I try to use the terms like person with opioid use disorder, or uh, rather than an addict, a user, an IVDUer. Um, opioid use disorder as the diagnostic term rather than opioid abuse or opioid dependence. Again, those terms were thrown out of the D when DSM was updated. Um, and instead of clean or dirty UA, negative or positive urine testing, um, you know, I would just strike these from your vocabulary if at all possible. So why does it matter to treat um, addiction? This is a helpful graph for me to characterize what's actually going on for folks with opioid use disorder. And um, on the um, y-axis here, I, I put what's termed affect, how people are feeling, and then time on the x-axis here. And um, with acute use of opioids, people get euphoria. And with repeated uses, you know, they get some tolerance to that. Um, but as people go, as people use opioids from the first few days to weeks, and move into the chronic use range, which is generally thought, felt to be months to years, what ends up happening is that they um, start going into withdrawal between episodes of use. And so really, um, the, the, a primary driver of their use is to help them feel normal again. And this has to do a lot with the neurochemical changes that happen in the brain um, with chronic opioid use and with um, physiologic dependence. And so what happens is um, people's all their other social obligations tend to fall apart because they are so focused on um, feeling normal again in order to accomplish everyday tasks. And that's where treatment comes in. Um, when we treat someone and help them stabilize as far as their affect, as far as their neurochemistry goes, it allows them to accomplish all of the important things in their lives that often have fallen by the wayside. So their work, their family obligations, et cetera. I would throw out an important distinction that I've kind of been hinting at 
you know, and I'm calling here primary versus secondary prevention of addiction, you know, there's a lot that can be done by surgeons and all clinicians to um, prevent somebody from falling in that, uh, the, into the trap of addiction in the first place, but there's also a, a subset of folks who are already suffering from an addiction, and those should be, those situations probably should be handled distinctly, I think most people would um, acknowledge. So we see this commonly on the acute pain service. When a patient already has an opioid dis use disorder and then gets a, has a traumatic injury um, or needs some uh, acute surgical intervention and has acute pain, you know, by withholding opioids, we're not going to cure their addiction. Um, they are already, um, you know, by not giving them oxycodone for a few days, that's not going to fix the problem here. Um, at the same time, providing opioids probably is not going to worsen their addiction. We want to do it in a safe manner and in a co well-coordinated manner. Um, but you know, the person is already using heroin or snorting oxycodone. Like you know, things are already off the rails here at this point in time. So the goal here is really to safely complete necessary medical care, or I would argue. Um, in this, in your your case, necessary surgical care, and I put the I underline the word safely here because I do want to emphasize that this is not willy nilly kind of um, pouring on opioids, but we want to um, do it in, a, like I said, a well coordinated, safe manner. So the medication treatments that kind of I live in and use regularly are going to be methadone and buprenorphine primarily, especially for folks that are having acute surgical issues. I put naltrexone up here. It's another FDA-approved treatment for opioid use disorder, but because it's a full opioid uh, antagonist, it's really um, rarely an option when folks have acute pain issues. And in addition to these, most patients do benefit from additional services like counseling, mutual support groups, and mental health care. So when do we do this? Ideally, preoperatively, like probably most things, um, what should happen before surgery if possible, and involve a multidisciplinary team of the surgeon, primary care folks, psychiatrists, addiction medicine, pain medicine. That's not always a reality as we know, especially at Harborview, we see so many folks that have kind of unex unanticipated acute traumatic injuries. And so there, there is some um, growing data showing that when folks come in uh, for acute medical issues or surgical issues, um, trying to engage them in care at that point in time, start treat medication treatment concurrently with their um, uh, inpatient hospitalization, and then link them to outpatient care. Um, that can be really helpful in engaging someone in care and uh, retaining them in treatment, which is a primary outcome that we think about from an addiction standpoint, because if folks stop coming, then um, they generally aren't getting better. So really, who you specifically call is totally dependent on where you practice. So um, sometimes it's going to be a social worker, chemical dependency counselor. Um, psychiatrists can be incredibly helpful. There is some variability in their comfort level or their familiarity with addiction treatment. And then um, if you have addiction medicine expertise available, that's a, a fairly scarce resource right now, unfortunately. At Harborview, what we have kind of conceptualized is um, we have something called the SBIRT service, the Screening Brief Intervention and Referral to Treatment Service, which is county funded dollars to have uh, chemical dependency counselors available for inpatients. Um, and they are really the first point of contact for folks. And then they, um, on an ad hoc basis, will get addiction specialists involved. Really right now, we're kind of in a pilot phase of this, trying to um, provide some of those inpatient based services for folks. And that's a collaborative effort between uh, psychiatry and the Department of Medicine. There's some federal or state and federal resources also. Um, the state funds it, this recovery helpline, which is available 24 7 and staffed by uh, volunteers, many of whom are themselves in recovery. Um, and the phone number is up there. They have a great, they have a nice website also. And then um, at a federal level, the the agency, which probably should change their name after what I was saying earlier, um, it's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, um, has locators both for methadone clinics and buprenorphine <coughs> prescribers, um, which are available at their website. So buprenorphine um, is a medication we could prescribe to treat opioid use disorder. And I would argue that if you have interest, this would be um, something you would be able to do. It requires a one-time eight-hour training that sometimes are available. They're available online, in-person, or mixed half-and-half programs. Um, and 
even if you don't do a lot of prescribing, um, just the training I think can be really helpful to get a better sense of what's involved with that um, particular medication. It's really the only medication that a clinician can prescribe for opioid use disorder, for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Uh, methadone needs to be dispensed at an opioid treatment program like a methadone clinic. And then this is more of an FYI, addiction medicine was just two years ago actually approved by the American Board of Medical uh, Specialties as a um, multi-specialty subspecialty. So there are um, many folks in a, an array of specialties, including surgeons, um, who um, have undertaken additional training um, for this board certification. And there are fellowship programs in development, including at UW, around this. So in summary, you know, I, I think that I would argue that surgeons can and should ask about addiction um, in a very frank uh, manner um, and think about our choice of language in order to combat that stigma and then refer to the appropriate resources um, whenever possible and as soon as early as possible. So I wanted to show this um, brief, it's about three minute video. Um, Barclay actually had asked for us to try to find a patient, although the hour um, was <laughs> prohibitory in that. We searched and searched, but most of our patients can't make it to clinic before noon, so uh, 6.30 was asking too much, I think. But we, but Deb and I had um, uh, helped this do this video for a separate project, um, but it involves a patient who um, was with an opioid use disorder who was treated at Harborview, gosh, maybe six years ago maybe, um, talking about his experience um, with, uh, he had an NSTI at the time, um, and he subsequently went on to be, uh, to complete nursing school and is working as a nurse, um, and has an interesting perspective having been a patient and now a healthcare uh, provider, um, so I wanted to share this with you in lieu of having a patient come and tell. Yeah, so... From my perspective as a nurse and also have been a, being a patient, um, you know, a long-term patient in Harborview for an acute thing like this, which was directly related to my drug use, I have this sense of empathy with what it actually feels like, not only just on a pain level, but also on a level of being discriminated against for your drug use, which, you know, is still seen as a moral failing. Um, I've, I've really appreciated getting to know people that even are in worse social situations than I have been that are living on the street, you know, that have been for decades that also have mental health issues. Um, because in a way, this this issue of drug use and also coping with drug use is a really intersectional thing, which is not just related to to the, the medical issue and mental health issue of drug use. It also has to do with, you know, socioeconomic issues and how to deal with stressors related to not being able to find a job or to not be able to have a, a, a place that you can afford in the city, you know, um, discrimination and racism and all this kind of stuff definitely contribute to, to your coping in life. And it's been really interesting to get this perspective and really get to know people on like the reasons why they might be getting into this. Within the hospital system, I had a lot of people that would be willing to sit down with me and like sit down on the bed, side of the bed with me and look at me in the face and treat me like a human. And those were all really good situations, like my occupational therapist who helped me learn how to walk again. She was fabulous. Um, and I had other people that maybe weren't so much. Like there was some little, really little things that helped me, both with my comfort in the hospital, but also even pain management, because I could expect and what was gonna happen in the future, like some people wouldn't write their names on the on the whiteboard sometime for, you know, like the entire day. I wouldn't know who my nurse is and I was completely dependent on people. There would be some providers that would come in and like introduce me to people individually and like talk to me like a person, but there'd be some people that would just go in there, turn on the lights, turn their back towards me, start talking to each other, not even ever say one word with me the whole, you know, couple minutes they were in there. And I felt like a subject rather than a patient. Um, and it felt really kind of demeaning in a way. And again, I don't know if that was my perception or not, but I was already in a very aggravated state um, because of my own pain that I was dealing with, but also feeling like a ghost um, didn't really help the situation and probably didn't help my pain management either. I know other people that I've worked with too that are really difficult patients to say, you know, that are gonna berate somebody 
they tell them to do something they don't want to do and that's that's hard another hard thing to deal with because it's like I remember also doing that when I was working in the hospital and you know back in the nurse's office where the you know there'd be you know gossip or prejudice about a difficult patient um, which definitely sets the nurses up for you know being ambivalent and you know negative about a certain situation that they have to do in their care um, but I think just like trying to still, that's kind of why I go back to like dealing with the capacity of healthcare providers to be able to deal with things and to not take it personally. And that's been my mantra in my work because every single patient I have is that difficult patient. Great. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you again. I appreciate all the work. Um, uh, ben Dunn to, uh, and Barkley and uh, Lacey to kind of bring us here. Uh, I'm going to bring this a little bit more uh, down to sort of the deck plates, the use of them in the uh, Navy phrases of sort of the day-to-day -day experience uh, that we have at Harborview. Um, long history of uh, innovation around pain and I think that we've got significant overlap uh, uh, with uh, addiction and, and, and supporting that patient population. You know, at Harborview, we've um, We've got an integrative service and in that uh, Deb Gordon's involved with myself and um, you know we have a perioperative pain service sort of care line that involves sort of preoperative management uh, plus uh, inpatient acute pain service as well as a transitional uh, service. You know in large part you know we're, we're a, busy, a busy service I think as you know all, all of you here know how busy the, the services are at Harborview. We've delivered 7,000 encounters uh, last year uh, for acute pain. But of note, you know, greater than 70% of the patient population of those encounters come with a substance use disorder, and 90% of them are opiate use disorders. That's a lot of management of opiate use disorders in a population at risk at Harborview. You know, how do we approach this? We have a team, and as mentioned earlier, you know, my emphasis is sort of working as teams. My background is a focus in teams. We have an integrated multidisciplinary pain team really to kind of meet the needs of this very complex population to hope ultimately to improve the outcomes. You know, our emphasis is on interprofessional care, you know, working on clear, defined pathways and with a significant focus on care transitions. So let's talk about a case, and I think this might be helpful to kind of put this in, in framework. And this case is something that, you know, uh, an extraction uh, from a, um, a number of patients we've seen in Harborview over the years, but um, a, a trauma rollover single passenger uh, who ultimately underwent a laparotomy and splenectomy. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what was noted um, it was epidural was placed, um, but was noted in the PACU that had high opioid requirements, sent to the floor, diet was advanced, you know, kind of a fairly standard and conservative oxycodone order with acetaminophen, so attempt at multimodal analgesia, has an epidural running. Um, but uh, you know, despite all that, frequent calls, uncontrolled pain, many IV boluses, um, the surgeons came by to evaluate for any postoperative complications. Everything looked fine. Uh, we're in the process of assessing uh, the epidural, uh, and what we see is a patient who's anxious, complaining about 10 out of 10 pain, uh, non-distant abdomen, but really difficulty in localizing really where that pain is. So difficult to get a pain history. You know, we do a more objective evaluation of the epidural, and we've got a pretty extensive epidural with T4 to T12, you know, and the patient then begrudgingly lets us know that he's occasionally been using heroin. And, and part of this hesitancy to reveal this is he doesn't really want to be treated like an addict. So, you know, from this scenario, I think over time, you, we, you know, we can see kind of three different things, even more than that, come out of that. And we'll kind of look at a minimal care integration, a moderate care integration, and then ideally an optimal care integration around their pain, their substance use disorder, and their surgical management. Uh, in this case, you know, much the same uh, patients uh, indicating uh, you know, that the epidural is working, but uh, still insufficient uh, pain management. Patient says he's not going to move until you manage his pain. His pain is poorly managed. He's not going to move. He's 10 out of 10 pain. Uh, IV hydromorphones ordered. PRN, oxycodone doses are significantly elevated uh, to end Q3 dosing. Patient now endorses better pain control, but still really bad. Um, Post-op day three, uh, we're looking at over 24 hours, 240 milligrams oxycodone, 12 milligrams of hydromorphone. 
uh, and he's watching the clock, agitated there's any delay in medicine, threatening to leave the team orders out of van to deal with some of the anxiety concerns around his management. Post-op day four, after it was discontinued, there's no change in pain. Uh, they reduced the IV to Q8 hours. Patient starts accusing them of not treating real pain. Uh, patient is leaving the floor, and nurse within a brief period of time finds needles at the bedside. Um, Post-op day seven, patient is ready for discharge, but he's just not gonna leave. He really refuses to participate in his, his, uh, his therapy, remains on uh, 10 to 30, fairly high, uh, high dose uh, oxycodone. Uh, they, uh, uh, using full doses of 30 at the Q4 intervals, uh, increased IV hydromorphone dose, Ativan was continued, refuses all of the non-opiate adjuncts, says they don't work, they, they has allergies or adverse effects to all. Patients discharged on post-op day 10, barely managed pain, 10 milligrams of oxycodone, 10 to 30 milligrams Q4, it was written for 252 tablets, and Ativan was continued. Post-op day 14, uh, readmitted following post-op check for a wound, NSTI, admits to frequently injecting heroin through the incision site, indicated it doesn't hurt as much doing it that way. So I, I think this is sort of a worst case. Um, uh, it, this is rare to see something I think this, um, it, it sort of reached this sort of point in management, but we, we clearly have seen circumstances when this, this has happened. Uh, I think we can, uh, we can inspire to uh, you know, sort of better uh, integration and a better you know, in scenario too, where there is some availability of a pain service uh, to sort of uh, address the patient's needs. In this case, the patient was started out on a PCA to kind of get a sense a little bit of his opioid requirements. Um, endorses better pain, but again, still really bad. Um, Post-up day three, we get a much more detailed history. So I think that when you have a service that's in, in individuals who are comfortable asking the questions and doing the right phrase, you know, this occasional daily habit, uh, daily use of, or, or occasional use of heroin, turns out to be a 200-day habit, you know, uh, during the last six months. Lost his job, is divorced uh, recently because of the ongoing use, so meets the sort of criteria as the consequences of abuse. Doesn't know what to do. Anxious, frightened, PRN, PRN clonidine is ordered. Post-op day four, again, so similar scenario. We discontinue the epidural. Was converted to oxycodone to meet based on his uh, IV use. Uh, similar sorts of dosing at Q3 intervals. Again, refuses to engage in therapy, uh, other non-opiates, at least in particular, uh, non-opiate adjuncts. Uh, accuses, again, team not treating real pain. Uh, again, uh, leaves floor, finds nearest finds needles at bedside. Uh, rehabilitation psychology consulted. Post up day seven, again, you know, saying he's not gonna leave with pain as bad as it is, continue with oxycodone, uh, discontinue the IV, encouraged uh, mobilization with additional dose for mobilization, hydroxyzine for anxiety, uh, and he continued to decline the opiate adjuncts. The rehab psychology was backlogged and really unable to see the patient in a timely fashion. Post-op day 10, again, uh, discharged home now, barely, you know, barely managed pain, uh, was able to be seen in a transitional pain clinic where they started to initiate an opioid taper. In this case, patient was discharged with 52 tablets, 10 milligram tablets, uh, and uh, on post-op day 12 was actually seen, was called in, uh, in the, asking for an early refill. Um, pain's worse than it's been, but denies fever, chills, or any change in the wound. Uh, threatens the call's paper, call paper for not, his treat, pain not being treated appropriately. Offered NSAIDs declines. Uh, 14, day 14, uh, seen in our post-operative pain clinic, altered mental status, declines illicit use, ran out of two pills two days earlier, UA ordered, was seen in clinic uh, shortly after that visit in the transitional clinic, uh, was again uh, readmitted for an STI, was injecting through his site uh, with heroin. It, what happens, what's different in this scenario? Uh, a little more integration, attempt to engage mental health, referral for treatment with a flyer, uh, avoidance of co-administered benzodiazepines, a good thing in this population. Early follow-up uh, to monitor so the opiate use uh, and reduction of diversion risk with, you know, 52 oxycodone 10 milligram tablets versus 252. And with the earlier presentations, you can see how critical that issue is in regards to community safety. Let's just look at case three. Um, again, sort of similar circumstances. Uh, pain services called a little bit more integration of pain service that works with uh, all the integrated elements that we have available. 
uh, PCA started, similar sorts, we look at a shift use of uh, 18 milligrams. Right there, you know, that starts to alert us that we've got somebody with some significant opiate tolerance. That's the benefit of that sort of uh, dose ranging with PCAs because it gives us a really a sense of what, what the patient, uh, uh, maybe their history is. Again, reveals a 200 degree, a 200 uh, day habit uh, and significant sequelae, uh, similar sorts of concerns about not sure what to do, anxious and frightened. And then in this case, this is what I think we start seeing a departure and really thinking about the downrange uh, management decisions that will help support this patient. Discuss with this patient uh, the need to replace his heroin while in hospital with an appropriate medical uh, substitute. And again, there are very few medications that meet, that meet that criteria. You saw the graph that Dr. Klein showed with reduced sort of fluctuations in plat you know, levels between feeling great or feeling poor and, and feeling good. Methadone, we start off and allows us to kind of standardize and, and really replete that, that opioid uh, that they've been utilizing illicitly. Uh, at the same time, we engage the expert providers to kind of, kind of start the process working where uh, we know we're going to need a lot of care coordination. Uh, methadone continues what we notice frequently after 24 to 48 hours market reduction in uh, hydromorphone use, uh, reduced requests for PCA boluses. You know, what often you'll see is a much more highly engaged patient uh, who's really ready to discuss being engaged in their, re uh, in their recovery from surgery, but also about their therapy. Uh, re rehab psychologist is able to, to uh, support the patient further in engagement. Uh, they will often dis express a desire to see spiritual care. We'll, su we'll assure that element's going to support them as well. In this case, epidural is discontinued, converted over to a much lower dose of oxycodone. IV hydromorphone is available for mobilization. Uh, th at this point now, realizing that uh, we're, we're addressing the opiate needs, often they'll be more inclined to accept the use of the non-opiate adjuncts. So, and the concern is you're not going to stop my methadone, we often hear. Uh, patient completes release of information. Uh, real critical part, you know, the care county nurse is made aware of the patient's desire for medication-assisted treatment on discharge. So we're looking at post-op day four, and we're having some significant dialogues about what are we going to do with this patient on discharge, and let's start planning for that now. Let's start planning for that now. Uh, they actually reach out to the local medication assisted treatment program, program ensures ability to support intake the following week, patient working well with the staff and mobilizing uh, readily. Post up day seven, uh, patient discharged at home, now can manage the pain, more optimistic, things can work out, methadone is consolidated with a 30Q day dose, patient returns to the hospital one day, post up day eight, to get a bridge dose of methadone from a uh, provider given to the patient. Uh, oxycodone they're discharged on is, you know, 5 to 10 milligrams, 24 tablets, again, going to see in a transitional pain clinic, uh, and all the range of non-opiate adjuncts are provided. Post-op day 10, follows up in the outpatient transitional program. Uh, first methadone dose was given the day before in the treatment program, and the plan is now to complete the remaining opiate taper in the transitional clinic by post-op day 21 or sooner. Post-op day 14, seeing the post-op check, he's uneventful, healing, thankful for care, adequately managed pain, never going to endorse perfect, but okay. Uh, he's been able to remain clean since, hopeful, uh, and now making daily visits to treatment program in Narcotics Anonymous. So, you know, what's different here, uh, I think, you know, we're looking to improve patient and provider satisfaction, uh, initiation of best practice, what they've already kind of outlined around medication to treatment for these individuals, market reduction, of opioid diversion, and risk for the communities, to reduce length of stay, certainly, you know, in this particular scenario as we presented it, possibly. Avoidance of association, uh, use associated readmission. We know the behaviors of many of these individuals put them at risk of subsequent medical problems and readmission and ED visits. How do we address that? How do we look at that concern? So what we've adopted is so our general principles of care are really optimized pain care, assuring safety, but stabilization of behavioral issues around substance use, critical to improve efficiency in care delivery for this patient population. Support opportunity to engage appropriate substance use treatment throughout the clinical service delivery is an important part. Uh, and address the community safety concerns brought, uh, dur that occurred during the inpatient stay and throughout care transition. So in order to do all that we just talked about, we've actually set up and structured 
a, a, a care algorithm that really works well, brings in some of the points that uh, Deb and, and Jared both mentioned of concurrently looking to address their opiate use disorder while optimizing their pain management with a goal of timing this so that they have a timely discharge from the hospital uh, and a reasonable uh, and appropriate management of their opiate use disorder concurrently while addressing those principles I mentioned before regarding uh, safe, effective pain care, engagement and treatment, and community safety. This one uh, ended up not getting quite as bad, uh, say, the right direction. What I'm pointing out, this is another pathway that we have for pre-op. So we mentioned, you know, the challenges in screening for these risk factors preoperatively uh, in your clinic where maybe the workflow doesn't, it isn't worked into the dialogue and isn't part of your workflow, we at Harborview, all elective patients are given the screen uh, uh, in the pack in our pre-anesthesia clinic. And if they flag positive for a history of either opiate or benzodiazepine use disorder, that's an alert that actually reaches us on the pain service and identifies the patient for uh, either potential preoperative evaluation where they'll reach out to us and we'll work towards scheduling or a clear identification of the need for an acute pain service uh, after surgery or on the day of surgery. And we'll, at that point, kind of initiate and move the patient through this care pathway that's active currently at, at Harborview. Um, we've also kind of worked around some care pathways around buprenorphine, uh, you know, both for elective surgery. Uh, we're seeing much, we're seeing increased frequency of buprenorphine prescribing. So, you know, what do we do with buprenorphine? How do we manage that? How do we address these patients who are clearly at risk around the surgical period for, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, going back and falling back to uh, prior use patterns uh, in the absence of addressing their treatment concerns. Uh, and we also for their emergent, urgent uh, cases as well. Uh, we've been looking at this as a, a poster we presented last year, essentially looking at initiation of methadone in this, in this pain population. Large part of the population is trauma. I'll just call out um, you know, the reduction in sort of MED that we see on discharge for this population with opioid use disorder. That's a low MED number. And I think, again, that of the group that we started, you know, 44% made it to an intake and dosing appointment. Now, that might seem like a particularly low number, but in this population, that's actually pretty, a pretty satisfactory number that actually shows up uh, at treatment and, and starts the process of treatment. You know, um, you know, why do we want to start treatment? My argument, I think what I would suggest is, you know, if we look really at the, at the longitudinal cost associated with not managing it, this is out of California looking at immediate access and sort of what the process we're doing at Harborview versus sort of the medical managed withdrawal in California, which is required, which essentially is no treatment. They look at differences as cost over time in these populations in this cohort. And there are significant benefits, both from the medical system and healthcare expenditures that we see over time, but also from a societal impact in the way of crime, uh, housing, and workforce. So potentially very large returns on the, the time and effort spent in improving that. You know, I think it really does meet sort of uh, uh, the triple aim and improving the patient experience, healthcare outcomes, uh, and the opportunity to, to reduce costs. You know, we, we at Harborview are proud. Uh, I think that much of what we're starting to do is being recognized at a state level uh, with, uh, with our, uh, uh, with, for the Community and Leadership Award in these processes that we're doing. Um, and uh, it's a great place to work, and it's a great place to, uh, it's a sense of mission that, for me, uh, leaving the Navy, uh, I still have that same sense of uh, mission uh, at Harborview, and I'm, I'm proud to work with uh, this great uh, team of, of surgeons that uh, I see every day, and we look forward to continuing to, uh, to work and support this population as best we can. I know we're just we pressed to get the time, uh, uh, the opportunity for questions.